Okay. Thank you for your introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Yuhua. Uh, I'm a postdoc from MIT CCL. And uh, today I'm going to do my presentation with my co-authors, Isabel and Michael, who are also from MIT CCL. Together we developed a technology named as Photochromilion, um, which can allow users to reprogram the physical color of objects. I'd like to start my talk with an example. Try to imagine if you want to recolor a car, doing this in the digital world is pretty easy, right? You can just realize it on your computer with some software. However, doing this in the physical world is pretty hard. You probably need to repaint your car, which is very expensive and uh, very time consuming. But have you ever imagined that if one day you can let your car update its own color, just like a chameleon? Okay, to address this, we developed a color changing material, which is very special. With our method, all you need to do is just spray this material onto the surface of the object. Then, by shining some specific wavelengths of light onto it, the color of this object can be changed, and you can customize a high-resolution, multiple-color image onto it. Once you remove the light source, the color remains in the natural environment. Then you can use it in the natural environment. If you don't, if you don't like this pattern anymore, you can just use UV light to erase it and recreate another one onto it. The most amazing part is that this process is fully reversible, and you can repeat it multiple times. Here I have some application examples to demo. And here is a shoe which is coated by our photochromic ink. And uh, we created uh, uh, the first pattern onto the shoe, which is shown in the upper right picture. Then we erased it and recreate another one onto it. Um, we just want to prove with our, our technology, we can allow users to customize their own outfits for different occasions without the need to buy different ones. And uh, here are three high resolution pictures which have been fabricated on the same cell phone case. And uh, actually, if you wish, you can feel free to change it on a daily basis if possible. You don't have to buy a lot of different phone cases just for different uh, color or diff different designs also. Um, we also applied our coating onto a car model to show the potential of, te of, of our technology in automotive industry. And just like I mentioned to you previously, the recovery of a car is very expensive and time consuming. Uh, however, I do believe there may come a day in the future everyone can customize their own patterns on their own cars if possible. If you're curious about how could we make it, let my colleague Isabel carry you go through the knowledge behind it. Okay, so how does this work in principle? So our coating uses photochromic dyes. So these are dyes that respond to light to change their color. So you can see here um, three colors. We shine UV light. The, uh, the inks turn from transparent to a colored state. And then we apply visible light and the inks turn from the color state back to transparent. So here we are, it's transparent now. As you have mentioned, this process is repeatable. So you, again, UV light takes it from transparent to colored, and visible light takes it from colored back to transparent again. However, we can only do this for one color. So you can see a, sing, uh, a transparent goes to a single cyan, or a single magenta, or a single yellow. So it's just one color. Our coating system can enable multiple colors. So we take inspiration from the uh, model of the inkjet printer, which uses uh, the CMY color model. So by mixing cyan, magenta, and yellow together to get a black ink, and then controlling the amount of cyan, magenta, and yellow that is currently active in the liquid, we can achieve a range of colors in the CMY space. So for example, on the right, you can see the CMY color model at the top. 
If you remove the, uh, the cyan, you end up with magenta and yellow, which leaves you with red. And you can see the second from left picture on the top row is a, is a red color. So how do we control each of the color channels? Well, on the left, you can see an absorption spectrum uh, with wavelengths of light. So each of the dyes, the cyan is on the right, the magenta is in the center, and the yellow is on the left. So what these wavelengths correspond to is the wavelength you need to deactivate the, uh, the color. So that means remove the color from the liquid. And it just so happens that this spectrum um, overlays quite well with a regular standard office projector. So by using a red LED, you can remove the cyan. By using a green LED, you can remove the magenta. And by using a blue LED, you can remove the yellow. So again, the application examples, we have a phone case here. We are sh uh, showing how we can coat um, a plastic. So this is, again, the high-resolution texture you saw earlier. 24 minutes to um, color this from an active, um, fully black state to the texture you see on the screen. Um, we've also shown that we can um, coat textiles as well. So we have the shoe example. And finally, uh, we've also applied this coating to metal. So how do we prepare our coating? Well, this is all you need, really. Um, we have the photochromic dyes. We have an automotive lacquer, which we mix the, mix the dyes into. And we just have a, a standard mixer there with a beaker. So we mix the lacquer with each of the, uh, the inks individually. So here's the cyan, the magenta, and the yellow. So we mix each of these inks for about half an hour. We then mix all three together. We use a ratio of 116, cyan, magenta, yellow. The reason why is that the, cyan, uh, the, the yellow ink, uh, the saturation isn't as strong as it is for cyan and magenta. So in order to ensure kind of an even color, we found that a ratio of 116 was the best for our um, applications. We then spray the ink onto the, um, onto the surface of the object. And then we program the, uh, the system itself. So I'll leave that to Michael. Yeah. So thank you very much. So you've seen like in the previous uh, parts in this presentation that we use uh, the color channels of projectors, so red, green, and blue, to deactivate dyes and to like come to a specific color. But like the question remains, like we always start from a fully saturated sample, so black, which is here color A. And like what do we actually have to do to come to a specific color B? All right. So, and we do this, um, so a specific color B might have like 50% saturation in magenta, 10% in yellow, for example. So we need to shine light for a specific uh, duration onto this material. So for example, red light for 200 seconds. So to answer this question, like how long this actually has to, has to be projected on, we need to like find the relation between the illumination time and how the dye uh, reacts to it. So like how does the saturation change uh, for each one of the light channels to be, uh, to be shined on? So we did an experiment for this. Um, what you see here are like three samples. So these are three coated surfaces with magenta dye, purely magenta dye, not a mixture, uh, cyan dye and yellow dye. And then we shone a uh, light on it, so a red light in this case. And uh, we let it like move like a bar from left to right. So when you imagine like when a, when a bar of red light moves from left to right, then the left areas of the cube have a, like, a shorter duration time because the bar moved away, while the areas on the right side of the cube have a longer uh, illumination time. So to illustrate this, we have a, f a fancy animation. So, and this is like pretty much what happens and what the result of this is. So like the surfaces pretty much form a gradient. So we took the images of uh, this gradient, uh, sampled them, and put them into it. Yeah, also, like we did this uh, for all the colors, of course, not just for red light, also for green light and for blue light. So we sampled uh, these images and put them into a figure to like, illustrate how actually like, this uh, 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 decay and saturation actually happens. And what you see here is um, uh, the effect for red light. So like, for simplicity, let's focus like, only on the effect of red light on the dyes. 
So our assumption is that with red light, we can efficiently deactivate cyan, while the other two uh, color channels, so magenta and yellow, um, are not uh, affected by it. And we see that this uh, assumption pretty much holds for yellow. Yellow is not affected by red light. And for cyan, it holds as well. It gets deactivated efficiently by red light. But we also see that magenta actually is influenced by red light, which is something that we actually didn't want to have. So like by the time we get, got completely rid of cyan, uh, magenta is also deactivated by, uh, like it's down to like around like 30% saturation. So like why does this happen? So let's go back to the absorption spectra that you also, that you've seen in the previous slides already. And we see here that the red light is like far away from, uh, I see like th there's like a yellow curve that's like really hard to see in the projector. Uh, but uh, like on the left part of this diagram, there is uh, the absorption spectra of yellow dye, which is like far away from the from the spectrum of red light. And we see it, in fact, that like, the yellow dye is not affected by red light. However, the red light uh, overlaps with cyan and magenta. More with cyan, that's why it's more efficient to deactivate cyan, but also like a little bit with magenta. All right, to now come like, to a specific uh, color and on this coating, we cannot go the naive approach and just say like, okay, we shine red light on it, deactivate cyan, and that's it. So it's obviously, obviously like a more complex problem. And to, uh, to, to, to challenge that, uh, we um, implemented it as an optimization problem. So we have here a, a term that we can minimize. Um, and this minimize is, constru is constructed out of two components. So we have the target color B that we want to achieve. All right. And uh, this is a, a difference between uh, this target color B and some function that gives us an estimate that is dependent on the illumination time T. All right. So, and if the and if our estimated color, if we if we find the T uh, such that the estimated color is equal to the target color, then we have pretty much zero and we have like a minimal uh, a minimum result, right? So, th where does this uh, function C now come from that gives us an estimation of the color? Um, we developed uh, this formula for this. So I want to go like a little bit into detail, like what this formula is actually doing. So X is our fully saturated color. So like imagine this is our cube when uh, the, the channels sine, magenta, and yellow are 100%. And uh, the other terms that get subtracted from this is the impact that each one of the color channels has on them. So the first uh, term here, for example, is the impact of red light that takes in the illumination time with, uh, TR with the red light, and then a linear factor uh, that reflects the impact of uh, the illumination time with red light. And the same for green light and blue light until we get our estimation. So we minimize this, uh, which gives us like a more optimum result, at least like we hope to, and you see the result of this here. So uh, you see like in the middle the naive approaches where we pretty much like ignored uh, the influence of light to like the different color channels and just shone, for example, uh, red light to deactivate sign. And you see that especially yellow in this case is uh, like very far away from like a yellow that we would say is a good yellow. While in our optimized approach, like all the colors are in Euclidean distance uh, closer to our target color than in the, in the naive approach. So we also like did an experiment where we wanted to see like with our coatings how large is our uh, color gamut that we can actually achieve. So uh, we plotted the C and the CIE XY chromaticity diagram. Uh, this one is like a little bit misleading because it's not uh, proportional to like what the perception of humans is. So I also like plotted to you what the color gamut of an inkjet printer is. So this is the color uh, gamut that an inkjet printer can achieve, and you can see that our results pretty much cover like half of the like uh, cover a quite large color uh, gamut already, and it's like half of what an inkjet printer can achieve. So to make this actually accessible and make it usable for everyone, uh, we developed an end-to-end -end system. So our system consists of a rotating platform uh, on which you can put your object, a UV light, an LED, that uh, is, uh, can activate the color, uh, can activate the coating to turn black, and then a high-resolution DLP projector that is actually projecting the texture that you want to have on the object uh, on its surface. So and this is how it looks like. Uh, we implemented a plugin for Blender that uh, does the computation. So you load your digital object into it, and then you use uh, Blender's um, uh, UV mapping tools to apply pretty much like an image, like your design of your choice uh, onto the object. So and once this is done, um, we offer you a preview function. So with this, uh, with this term that I introduced earlier, we can, it doesn't do it, no? Okay, we can uh, actually like estimate like how the uh, product will look like after uh, treating it. And then you just have to click on like export and then it does the activation with the UV light, what you see here automatically. And then starts the projection. It also like accounts for the curvature of the object, uh, for example, because uh, like a stronger curvature means that less light will uh, reach it. So we illuminate it for longer. 
All right, let's come to future work. Um, so like there are like still like a few challenges. So like this is like the first kind of uh, using photochromics for like high resolution textures. Uh, so there are like still some things that, that can be made better. For example, our color gamut is like not as large as that one of an inkjet printer, for example. And one main reason for this is that our uh, uh, color primitives, so like the cyan dye and the magenta dye, are not really like the perfect cyan and not the perfect magenta. And we are looking at the moment into new materials that are, that are coming closer to this like proper CMY color space model. Um, okay, wrong key. So, and a second limitation is uh, the like how long uh, these textures actually survive on the on the surface. So you've seen we use visible light uh, to deactivate the colors, and of course, uh, environment light, sunlight is also affecting them. So while for magenta and for cyan dye we actually get pretty good results. So like the the coatings like last for uh, pretty much one day until you like have to like resaturate them. Yellow is at the moment a limitation. So under office lights at 150 lumen we measured it, uh, it decays uh, after five hours. So, but they're also like good news. So, uh, we experimented with like just increasing the brightness of, for example, the UV light or the projector, and we've seen that the activation speed and the deactivation speed, so the saturation speed and the desaturation speed, uh, can be scaled with like a higher brightness. So, by just using, for example, two UV LEDs, we can uh, we can double the speed of activation. And there are opportunities. Um, so, like, what we were like really interested in um, at the moment, we like use a spray ink to, to, to like apply this this coating on any kind of object that's already given. But it would be, of course, also like super interesting to uh, integrate it into a fully digital 3D printing process. So, we did some experiments by mixing these dyes into a resin that you can uh, SLA print, for example. Uh, we were also like interested in putting it into filaments uh, to make like uh, FDA printing. Another idea is like it would be like super awesome if you can actually also put it on our T-shirts uh, on, and onto fabric, like into materials that are also stretchable. So can we put it into a bath uh, of photochromic dye and then pretty much like dye uh, texture, yarn, uh, fabrics, yarns, all these kind of things. So in summary, uh, to say like what we did here, uh, what we like presented here is like an, is an accessible fabrication technique uh, to have reprogrammable uh, surfaces that support a multicolor system uh, and with like very high resolutions. So and with this, oh, okay, we had like several versions of like the summary slide as you can see. So, <laughs> and with this I want to end my talk, I want to thank you all and we would be happy to answer your questions. Um, excellent work, uh, Roll Vertigal Huawei. Um, I have a question for you. This fading is a bit of a problem. Like, if you put this in sunlight, it's probably gone within minutes, right? Uh, yeah, like, for like 30 it, minutes or so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions with regards to potential fixating media? Like, one of the problems is if you want to fixate it so that visible light doesn't enter, then it also means you can't see anything. Yeah. <laughs> this is a bit of a problem. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions? Yes. Uh, actually, this dye, um, currently this dye is not so perfect. We still need some chemical scientists to uh, help us to find out a better dye, which can uh, have a very good property. Another way is from a aspect of uh, optics, we can coat some coating onto the painting so that um, it can may protect some wavelengths from yeah, but the problem is if you if you if you protect it from visible light, then the result would be black. So, um, but you know there might be something in the electron structure. You might want to look into the electron structure if you what the mm -hmm. chromodynamic ink is doing, and maybe you can fixate that or something. I don't know, but it's it's very cool work. Thank you. So like another like suggestion that we actually had yesterday in the demo, and this idea was like super awesome, is like to do some coating uh, that has different properties from directional light. Yeah. So for example, like it doesn't uh, like it reflects light pretty much. It comes from the ceiling, so like where the light sources are. While if you're like in the same uh, level or so, you can see it. So yeah. I thought this was interesting, and I want to look into it. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, Megan Hoffman from Carnegie Mellon University. I'm wondering if uh, this process is safe for putting on the skin or hair or something like that. Can you use this as a way to kind of temporarily augment a person? Um, so at the moment, we're basically dissolving the, the inks into um, a lacquer system, which is um, 
not really safe for putting on the skin at the moment. Um, but we are investigating other mediums of um, other kind of solvents and uh, materials that we can dissolve the inks into. Um, so we have looked at kind of resin systems, um, 3D printing, etc. But we haven't got as far yet as looking at kind of putting it on the human body. Okay, so uh, if we can thank uh, Wahoo. Oh, God. I'm sorry. It's okay. I practiced so many times. No I'm very sorry. Uh, <laughs> no you are. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Isabel and uh, Michael again. Thank you very much.